Okay, everyone, if we could find our seats, we are about to get underway with our final session of the conference. We are delighted to gather one last time to reflect on our theme of human dignity in a secular world. This weekend's conversations have been very fruitful, at times challenging, and even in, and, and, but also encouraging. It's taken place not just in our panel sessions, but also in the hallways, at the coffee breaks, over our shared meals, and even late into the night, in Roar's Bistro, hotel lobbies. That's the nature of this. Friendship undergirds everything that we do at the DeNicola Center, and this conference is no exception to that. Uh, we've been able to renew old friendships, make new friendships, and to acknowledge the dignity that we all share as persons created in the image and likeness of God. And tonight, to cap off our shared conversation, we welcome a profound thinker who has spent her entire career reflecting deeply on this theme of human dignity, my very dear friend, my beloved friend and mentor and, and wine aficionado friend, partner, <laughs> late night Italian conversation, partner Marianne Glendon, Evangelium Vitae Medal Award winner, the, uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award that we offer for the heroes of the pro-life movement. She is, she is a senior research fellow of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. Uh, in addition to being the learned hand professor of law emerita at Harvard University Law School, the former US ambassador to the Holy See, uh, and a permanent distinguished research fellow here, as I said before, at the University of Notre Dame at the DeNicola Center. She specializes in human rights, comparative law, and political theory. She has served on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and the U.S. President's Council on Bioethics, where we first met almost 20 years ago. The first time we hung out was at a Korean restaurant in Arlington, Virginia. You remember that? <laughs> anyway, um, she previously served as president of the Pontifical Academy for Social Sciences, was a member of the Board of Supervisors of the Institute of Religious Works, which is otherwise known as the Vatican Bank, and represented the Holy See at conferences, including the 1995 UN World Conference on Women in Beijing, where she headed the Vatican delegation. Uh, Professor Glennon was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1991, received the National Humanities Medal in 2006, and was the recipient of the Notre Dame Evangelium Vitae Medal in 2018. She's the author of such award-winning books as A World Made New, Eleanor Roosevelt and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, Rights Talk, Abortion and Divorce in Western Law, which was the winner of the Scribes Book Award for Best Writing on a Legal Subject, and The Transformation of Family Law, winner of the Legal Academy's highest honor, the Order of the Coif Triennial Book Award. Earlier this year, Marianne and I filed an amicus brief before the United States Supreme Court in the pending case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, the most important case concerning the law of abortion since Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Marianne's address tonight is entitled Dignity and Human Rights, The Problem of Foundations. Please welcome our wonderful friend, Marianne Glennon. Thank you, Carter, for those kind words and let me add my voice to those who are so deeply grateful to you for these conferences, for the opportunities that you've given us for discussion, for fellowship, opportunities that are hard to find elsewhere these days. God bless you. Now, Thank everybody for being here tonight after dinner to hear yet another talk on a subject that you, you've probably heard every nook and cranny of the subject of human dignity explored over the past few days. And uh, I'm going to explore another corner, uh, the corner that is of uh, interest to me is a subject that doesn't rank very high on the list that most Americans prepare if, they, if people ask them what issues they're most interested in. You won't find international human rights very <clears throat> on those lists at all, usually. I looked. Uh, and if it were on the list, it wouldn't be very high. But it is a subject that is literally a matter of life and death to many people in the world. And as it happens, 
uh, that project, the post-World War II human rights project, is one where the concept of human dignity is central to the documents and also central to the discourse in that field. And that is why it is rather unsettling to realize that there is no widely agreed upon definition of the term in that context. The um, leading, I think, the leading human rights authority in the late 20th century was a professor named Lewis Henkin, and he wrote in his treatise the following. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights provided the idea of human rights with a universally acceptable foundation, a supreme principle, that of human dignity. And when he wrote that, he was only stating what was widely assumed or accepted in the field. But the fact is that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights merely asserts that recognition of human digni dignity is a foundation of human rights. So that's why our philosopher Pope, St. John Paul II, said he celebrated the Universal Declaration all the time. He was a big fan. But on its 50th anniversary in 1998, he said, the document lacks the anthropological and ethical foundations of the human rights which it proclaims. And as for dignity, as I'm sure you've been hearing over the past few days, doubts have been raised in many quarters over the years as to whether it can serve as a universally acceptable foundation. And this raises the question of whether the post-World War II Human Rights Project has any foundations at all. And that is what is really at stake in the debates about dignity in the human rights field. And that is why it is up, it's time really to face up to an uncomfortable fact about the Human Rights Project, which is that the founders of that project deliberately, deliberately left the question of foundations for another time and other people. They were satisfied with consensus, with a broad consensus that foundations could be found on a, that support could be found on a few basic principles, a modest set of principles, even though um, that statement couldn't be proved as yet. And that 1948 consensus is not something to be sneezed at. It was, in fact, a remarkable achievement as is becoming more evident every day now that the consensus is faltering and many powerful countries are actually attacking it. So can it really be the case, as the great Alistair McIntyre famously said back in the 1980s, that belief in human rights is a one with witches and unicorns, that there is no such thing. And that poses the question of whether those of us who have believed in human rights and do believe in human rights, whether we, all those years, whether we've been like Wiley Coyote, <laughs> who keeps running off the cliff until he looks down and sees that there's nothing there. Now, not to keep you in suspense, my answer to that question is going to be no, but it will take a little time to get there and I know how I feel when I go to a lecture after dinner in the evening. I like to have a little outline of where the speaker is going, at least so I can find out how close he or she is getting to the end. And uh, so here are, the, here are the steps by which I hope to show that Friends of Human Rights are better off than Wiley e. Coyote. So uh, number one. How did dignity get into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Charter in the first place? And what was the understanding of dignity in those sources? And why did the founders of the Human Rights Project leave the question of foundations for another day? And then, I'm on number four now, the contemporary deconstruction of dignity. Number five, why the Human Rights Project does not hover over an abyss, and finally, what needs to be done by Friends of Human Rights to shore up the project. 
So let's start with the somewhat tortured story of how dignity got into so many 20th century human rights documents, including the Universal Declaration. You might be surprised to know that the commission, the Human Rights Commission that framed the Human Rights Declaration, had virtually no discussion over the 18 months that they were in session, virtually no discussion of why there were human rights. It's, it, it's surprising in a sense, but in another way it's not surprising because they were men and women in a hurry. During World War II, there had been many calls for a declaration. They called it an International Bill of Rights. There had been many calls for such a document, and uh, the UN was in a hurry to respond to those calls. And so the commission was under pressure to get something done and get it done fast. Now, uh, at the commission's first meeting, there were two philosophers. There were only two philosophers on that commission. One was Charles Malick. I think you can see him over on your right with his head down. He looks like he's looking at some papers. And then uh, the nationalist Chinese delegate who is over close to the left. And uh, he's, got, he's got the crutches behind him. They're not his crutches. I think they belong to John Humphrey. But those two, they were the two guys who said, wait a minute, uh, before we get started on drawing up this document, we should have a discussion of the premises on which it's based. Well, the other members of that distinguished commission were having none of it. Uh, the Indian delegate, Mrs. Mehta, said, we are not here to enter into a maze of ideology. Let's get to work. And Mrs. Roosevelt in the chair quickly steered the discussion back to the schedule of meetings. So at the very end of the process, that was it. Uh, at the very end of the process, however, they uh, did agree on a preamble which stated the following, quote, recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal and unalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. There it is. And um, well, this is close. That is as close as the commission got to saying anything about some kind of foundational principle. So how did dignity get in there? Well, if you look at the second whereas clause, you see that uh, the proximate source was, in fact, the 1945 UN Charter, which opened with a clause on the UN's very reason for being. And that clause said, whereas the peoples of the United Nations have in the Charter reaffirmed their faith, note the word, faith in fundamental human rights and in the dignity and worth of the human person. So how did dignity find its way into the UN Charter? Well, by the 1940s, that word was very prominent, not in Anglo-American discourse, but it was very prominent in all the constitutions and rights documents up to that time in Latin America and in many European countries. So much so that uh, comparatists like me, we call that family of documents the dignitarian documents, the Latin American and the European documents. And one of those documents was the number one major model for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that document was the first attempt to have an international declaration of rights. That's why it was important in the UN. It was the Pan-American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, uh, sometimes known as the Bogota Declaration, which begins with the clause, whereas the American peoples have acknowledged the dignity of the individual. So how did dignity get into the Latin American and European documents? That was largely due to two factors. Uh, first, the influence of Christian social and Christian democratic political parties. And um, they, in turn, of course, were much influenced by early Catholic social teaching. And the other source was the influence on international law theory of Dutch 17th century jurists. And that brings me to step two of our search, where we ask, what was the justification offered for the idea of human dignity in those sources. Many of those sources 
offered the same justification that you will find in your Catholic catechism if you look at section 1700, uh, where it says, the dignity of the human person is rooted in his creation in the image and likeness of God. Others, other sources like the Protestant jurist Samuel Puffendorf, who is generally thought of as the father of international law or generally credited with introducing the concept of dignity into international law, I should say. Uh, he regarded um, dignity as, quote, the God-given capacity to understand God's will. Now, as you have probably been hearing over the past few days, those justifications, while they are perfectly satisfactory to many of us, are not free of difficulty. Uh, the catechism, for example, also teaches that d dignity is something to be fulfilled and that sin can affect human dignity. But in any case, none of those justifications is really convincing to everyone, especially when you get uh, outside, in, as you do in international law, as you, when you get outside the West, and when you get critics who have an uncritical faith in uh, a certain kind of Darwinism or science, and uh, which draws them into social Darwinism, and critics who's, this is a very common type of critic, the legal realists, some of whom felt their own personal experiences with war and man's in inhumanity to man made them lose their faith in any concept of human dignity. The most celebrated American jurist, that, was, that would describe uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who came back from the American Civil War totally disillusioned and very influential. <laughs> so he wrote in an article that he ironically titled Natural Law the following, I see no reason for attributing to man a significance different in kind from that which belongs to a baboon or a grain of sand. The, the sacredness of human life is a purely municipal ideal of no valid, validity outside the jurisdiction. So World War II comes to end and you have camps of legal realists, uh, political realists, who think that the idea of having an international bill of rights is just silly. And you have others, uh, like the American Anthropological Association, who says they're, they're, they laughed their heads off when they heard about this. Um, that's <laughs> that's um, not really Ruth, Bede, Ruth, Mead and, uh, Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead, but uh, they did think the idea was foolish, and they did send a letter to the UN saying that they doubted very much that there could ever be universal human rights. So this brings us to step three. Why did the founders of the post-World War Human Rights Project leave the question of foundations for another day? Well, as I mentioned, they're busy men and women. Uh, they uh, ignored the, the advice of the anthropologists and the skepticism of the realists. And um, the UN decided to get the work going on the declaration, but for UNESCO to create a special commission composed of many of the leading thinkers of the day. And the task assigned to that commission was to study whether there could be such a thing as a universal human right, right that would apply to everybody everywhere. Well, um, that commission, I have to say, you know, reading what they did, um, they made a noble effort, but I think most of us would have to say it wasn't very scientific. They sent a questionnaire around the world. <laughs> They sent a questionnaire around uh, saying, do you think there can be something as a universal human right? And tons of responses came back. Mahatma Gandhi answered. I mean, they sent it to all leading thinkers and political figures. And uh, in the end, what they concluded on the basis of that very unscientific survey was that there were a few basic practical concepts of decent human conduct that were widely shared though not 
always, as you can imagine, in the language of rights. And that led them to advise in their report, quote, the members of the United Nations share common convictions upon which human rights depend. But then they added an important qualification. They said, those common convictions are stated in terms of different philosophical principles and on the background of divergent political and economic systems. And it was that qualification that led Jacques Maritain to make the famous remark that I'm sure many of you heard, yes, we agree on the rights so long as you don't ask us why. Well, Maritain, sometimes that remark is uh, misunderstood because Maritain did not mean they were, there were no foundations. He meant that there probably were, but the investigation of those foundations and all the different cultures was yet to be undertaken. And so that is what they left for another day. And I think you could say, and here I'm indebted to Ralph McInerney, the late great Ralph McInerney, to, um, for the image of human rights as something like this. Sorry, <laughs> not like that. Um, sort of like a platform that rests on legs, but the legs are different. And the investigation that needed to take place, they said sometime in the future, they hoped it would be done, uh, those legs had to be different to see if foundations for the principles could be found in most of the world's philosophical and religious systems. Obviously, philosophical nihilism wouldn't be one of them. Um, so uh, they concluded, the philosophers concluded that that was enough for the uh, statesman to go forward with drafting the declaration. Meanwhile, there's no evidence that I can find that uh, the statesman paid the least attention to what the philosophers actually discovered and said, but it would have been comforting to them maybe if they had known about it. Um, Maritain said, the goal of the declaration and the goal of UNESCO is a practical goal. Agreement can be reached not on the basis of common speculative ideas, but on common practical ideas, not on the same conception of the world, but on the affirmation of a single body of beliefs for guidance in action. Well, um, that conclusion was actually validated, in a sense, when, to the surprise of many, the Universal Declaration was approved by the already diverse UN General Assembly in 1948 without a single dissenting vote. However, there were eight abstentions, and those abstentions were ominous. The six-member Soviet bloc, South Africa, and Saudi Arabia. That signaled trouble ahead sometime. But um, before, we, before I move on to the next step, what is very interesting about the deliberations, both of the Philosophers' Committee and the Human Rights Commission, the word dignity, the concept of dignity, did not figure prominently in their work, nor did they ever suggest that the concept was foundational to their work. Interesting. So now we come to step four, the deconstruction of dignity. Almost everybody who worked on the human rights project in the 1940s after the war, almost everybody celebrated the approval by the UN General Assembly as a great victory. But there was one person, the rapporteur of the um, human rights, uh, uh, the philosopher study group, uh, that person was my old philosophy professor, Richard McKeon at the University of Chicago. There was one person who was fretting already. He wrote, different understandings of the meanings of rights usually reflect different concepts of man and society, which meant, he predicted, that difficulties will be discovered in the suspicions concerning the tangential uses that might be made of a declaration of human rights for the purpose of advancing special interests. That was a philosopher's way of saying, watch out this whole thing could blow up in your face. For a while, it seemed that McKeon was the one who was overly cautious because the Universal Declaration did, in fact, become the single most important cross-national reference for cross-national discussions about human decency, 
And the ideas in the human rights became pole stars of the great grassroots movements that affected the fall of apartheid in South Africa and the toppling of the seemingly indestructible totalitarian regimes of Eastern Europe. But by the end of the 20th century, after those great victories, McKeon's prediction did come true. And the more that human rights ideas showed their moral force, the more contending interest groups sought to capture their prestige for their own purposes. And the more the concepts of human rights and human dignities showed their fragility. The playwright statesman Václav Havel, great hero, of those transformations, he was one of the first persons to notice that the word dignity could, as he put it, at one moment radiate great hope and another emit lethal rays. At UN conferences in the 1990s, the assault on the UN, um, the Universal Declaration's dignity language, explicitly directed toward the dignity language, began with the population control lobbies and with advocates of rights that often clashed with the Universal Declaration's provisions on protecting marriage and the family, provisions on religion. It was only, more, it was only a matter of time before the contending interests began to speak of deconstructing and reconfiguring the entire human rights framework. And in fact, a European coalition, European coalition at the Beijing conference uh, attempted to have all cross-references to the word dignity in the Universal Declaration eliminated. They were unsuccessful, but uh, that's how uh, far the process had gotten in the mid-1990s. But at the same time, the concept of human dignity was coming under another attack from scientists, Bill, and entrepreneurs who wished to remove obstacles to certain kinds of experimentation. So Harvard biologist Steven Pinker charged in an article titled The Stupidity of Dignity. He said the concept was not only meaningless, but it was harmful when used to oppose innovations that could enhance or lengthen human life. And the biotechnology forces were soon joined by the in vitro fertilization and abortion industries. Uh, in a much quoted article titled, I love these titles, Dignity is a Useless Concept, Dignity is Stupid, Dignity is Meaningless. Hmm. Uh, bioethicist Ruth Macklin argued that dignity should be subsumed into other conceptions such as respect for individual autonomy. Now while those groups were attacking dignity, others such as advocates of euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, were appropriating the word for their own purposes. All in all, it's not surprising that in the late 1990s, Nobel Prize-winning poet Cheslov Milos speculated ruefully about the fate of what he called those beautiful and deeply moving words which pertain to the old repertory of the rights of man and the dignity of the person. He said, I wonder at this phenomenon because maybe underneath there is an abyss. After all, these ideas had their foundation of re in religion and I'm not over optimistic as to the survival of religion in a scientific technological situation. How long, he said, will they stay afloat if the bottom is taken out? And indeed, if one looks at the founding documents, the major founding documents of the post-war human rights project, you can see why Milos feared that the bottom might be falling out. It's remarkable how much stress they put on faith after emerging from a war in which faith and humanity had been sorely tested. Take a look, the UN Charter, why is the United Nations being founded? To reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of the human person. The UNESCO Committee on the Philosophical Bases for Human Rights. An international declaration of human rights must be the expression of a faith to be maintained. UDHR preamble, whereas the peoples of the United Nations have reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights. So that's a lot of faith 
for these secular documents. And it's no wonder that many of the legal and political realists regarded the UDHR as little more than a connect collection of, of meaningless phrases. So what gave the authors of these documents grounds for their faith, their confidence in things yet unseen? Well, this brings us to step five, the one you've been waiting for, why the Human Rights Project does not hover over an abyss. Maritain. According to Maritain, he said, it was the same crisis that offered to our gaze the gravest violations of human rights that simultaneously led the public mind to a keener awareness of those rights and led governments to pay them, at least in words, the most ringing tributes. Clearly, the many calls for some kind of International Bill of Rights during World War II expressed an increasingly felt desire in many parts of the world for affirmation of some kind of common standard of decency. In the years since, many secular and religious thinkers alike have grounded their theories of human rights in the human ability to reflect upon and learn from experience. And this body of thought I associate with Maritain, with McInerney, and um, with my colleague, Alan Dershowitz, who wrote a little book called Rights from Wrongs. That way of thinking about human rights cannot be captured in a static image, like a platform with many legs. It can't be captured in a static image because it involves a process, a dynamic interaction among experience, faith, and reasoning, a process that involves experiencing, reflecting on experience, coming to judge judgments which then can be reviewed. I can't come up with a two-dimensional picture of that, but I can borrow an image that is sometimes used to explain another complex and dynamic and interacting threefold relationship. <laughs> all in all, I think it's fair to say that what undergirded the post-war human rights project at its outset was a combination of things. The hard-won wisdom from recent experiences, the conviction that without a few shared principles, nothing is left but the will of the stronger, the support to be found in the world's major philosophical and religious traditions, and the opportunities for self-correction in the operations of the human mind. And from that perspective, what underlies the human project, the human rights project, is not an abyss, but an ongoing process of experiencing, understanding, judging, and acting. And what is universal about that process are the structures of the human mind. Now, at this point, I dare not tread further on the province of theologians, except to say that uh, the writings of Emeritus Pope Benedict are instructive on the ways that faith and, understand and reason can purify each other. But an, inquis an inquisitive person is bound to ask, and maybe you are asking, what about all the ways in which perceptions, reasoning, judgment can be distorted? What about blind spots, forgetfulness, individual biases, biases that affect whole groups and cultures? Yes, the process, this, this is, it's, it's maybe not an abyss, but it is something that is moving and dynamic and that could go in the wrong direction because there's no getting around the fact that man is fallen. Or if you prefer, there's Gary Larson's theory that um, there was something wrong with the cake mix. Um, but um, given, yeah, we'll get back to the shamrock. Um, <laughs> man is fallen, let's stick with man is fallen there. Um, Given the present state of affairs where the foundations for human rights are concerned, I think we can see why the political fact of consensus is so important and why it's always loomed so large. 
The framers of the Universal Declaration, states persons with a couple of philosophers thrown in, they understood that the resolution of most political issues does not require delving into foundational questions. And the consensus that was achieved in 1948 on a relatively small core of principles was a remarkable achievement. It represented an acknowledgment on the part of the participants that some things are so terrible in practice that no one will openly approve them, and that some things are so good in practice that nobody will openly denigrate them. Underlying that acknowledgment is an experience-based insight that goes all the way back to antiquity, to the Athenians and the little inhabitants of the island of Milos, that if there are no principles that are independent of government, independent of power, then the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must, as Thucydides told us. So the achievement of that consensus in 1948 was so remarkable that perhaps one should be more surprised that it lasted as long as it did, rather than by the fact that it is currently faltering. But faltering it is. Memories of the 20th century's wars are fading, and the bloody regional and ethnic conflicts that have followed have impaired the sense of unity of the human family. Economic and technological developments have brought new risks that human beings will be treated as instruments or objects, and practical nihilism has trickled down to the capillaries of society, draining the regenerative powers of faith and reason. And if that weren't bad enough, some of the world's most powerful countries are currently seeking to undermine the consensus that supported the original agreement on a few basic ideas. So uh, this brings me to the last part of these remarks. What can be done, what can Friends of Human Rights do to shore up the International Human Rights Project? And one promising sign is the beginning of serious attention to the unfinished business of foundations. The UNESCO philosophers ended their report with the hope that some group or groups in the future would undertake to demonstrate or at least provide evidence in favor of uh, what their survey, their unscientific survey, led them to believe was true about the existence of shared civilization of principles. And it's heartening to see that some such studies have actually begun. And if those efforts continue, I would venture to say that some of those studies in some parts of the world would find that Dignity is indeed a prominent and foundational concept, but some others would not. So um, we, wait, we wait and see on that. But if those studies, those studies could have uh, another effect that would be extremely beneficial both for rights at the national level and international human rights, if those studies do draw upon the rights traditions or the basic foundational principles in each country's system, that will help to reinvigorate human rights where they really count. Human rights, in the end, are a problem of transformation of culture. So these, these studies are very much to be encouraged. And it will be especially good news if they produce a reinvigorate, re reinvigoration of dedication to rights at home and international rights. Um, and where international human rights are concerned, I do want to end on a, a hopeful note. And it is the fact that despite all the problems with international human rights right now, and despite the fact that the liberal democracies seem to be uh, preferring commercial and other interests over uh, defending human rights in their foreign policy, the, the picture is not that bleak. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is still the primary cross-national reference point for discussions of issues of freedom and dignity. And it's still the case that the principles in the Universal Declaration train the searchlight on the worst violations 
that are taking place in the world. That's not nothing. It's not everything that we want, but it's not nothing. And it's still the case that hardly any flagrant or repeated violation of human rights goes uh, without publicity. It's still the case, as we see on uh, the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, it's still the case that most governments do go to great lengths to avoid being blacklisted as notorious violators. So the main challenge, I would say, for Friends of Human Rights begins way down in the capillaries of every society, which means there's work for all of us to do. The main challenge is to strengthen support for a small core of basic principles that have a claim to be universal and to assure that human rights continue to be an instrument supporting human freedom and dignity and not become instruments of new forms of oppression. Thank you very much. All right, friends, we can come to the uh, microphones and we can have some, some conversation before we break. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Marianne. That was great. Thank you. Tell us, tell us who you are for the... Um, my name is Ryan Anderson. I did my PhD here, um, completed it seven years ago, and now I'm at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in DC. Um, I have a question for you. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, what if it would have been the Universal Declaration of Human Duties? Um, and I, I'm inspired by this question from uh, Alistair McIntyre's talk yesterday when he encouraged us to think and speak in terms of justice. And you can express a justice claim either in terms of rights or duty. Your right to life is my duty not to kill you. Your right to freedom is my duty not to enslave you. Um, what did we gain by having the declaration framed in terms of rights? And what did we lose uh, by not having it framed in terms of duties? We would have gained so much. And uh, I'll just list some of the things we would have gained. And, what, and a great irony in the drafting of the Universal Declaration. Uh, in, in the discussions, that point was raised by the nationalist Chinese delegate, mm -hmm. one of the philosophers. And uh, he said, uh, we shouldn't have just a declaration of rights, we should have a declaration of duties. And this was not unprecedented. The Latin American declaration that was a model for the UDHR was the Latin American or the Pan American Declaration of Rights and Duties. duties. Right. So this is the irony and how decisions get made without thinking about their, it was a stylistic decision. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the French member of the commission who was in charge of the the, just the style and the arrangement. He said, no, we should, for the sake of uniformity, it should be everyone has a right or everyone is entitled to. Uh, now, the other way in which I think it would have made an enormous difference is it would have helped to clarify the important decision between rights that mark boundaries which government must never ever cross and principles like the social and economic principles that depend on the material resources of the state and political judgments in the state. Now that distinction is in the declaration, but when you use the language of rights, it uh, blurs the distinction. Great. So yes, good question, but the train left the station. <laughs> well, I, short follow up, would you encourage us to speak like those er earlier declarations, both of rights and duties? Is that one way of defending the Human Rights Project moving forward to recast it as both a declaration of rights and duties? I think it would be duties? terrifying to ask the United Nations to revisit the <laughs> Universal Fair Declaration. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. My name is Raul Rodriguez. Um, and like Ryan, I was a, a PhD student here at Notre Dame. Um, and my question is somewhat similar to his. I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you might call the problem of human rights or the problem of, of modern natural rights that I think human rights is a development of. And when I say uh, natural rights, you can think of it as um, a right that's of justice, a claim of justice that according to nature. And so you have what you might call classical natural right, and you have modern natural right, and you have human rights that seems to be a development of modern nat natural rights. And I think human rights can be very problematic because it develops from modern natural rights 
that in some ways tries to go back to nature, which might be one foundation, or another foundation might be God, that in, at least in John Locke, you have these two foundations. But then you have the foundation of history, which you kind of talked about uh, after World War II, the experience of the Holocaust experience. We sort of see the problems and we have to have this foundation in that history sort of shows us. But then obviously, what does it mean to be human? Well, in very modern thought, what it means to be human might be to, uh, you know, it's a changing concept. And so human rights changes over time. And so some of the problems that you pointed out with human rights. So I just, uh, with that, I guess, statement, I was just curious to hear a little bit more about what you might call the problem of human rights being grounded in modern natural right uh, philosophy. Yeah, I, th this is why I really am very hopeful about the beginnings of, um, I would say, the continuation of that old study group uh, to look into the way in which a few basic principles of decency, it's a, the list is going to be small. That's something that uh, we tend to forget uh, as uh, advocates of, of uh, different interests that, uh, you know, uh, I could, could give you the list. I think there's something like 2,000 uh, things that are proposed to be uh, international human rights. I, I think the studies that ask the question of what support is there in my country's tradition or my group's tradition for a few basic principles of human decency. In the end, that's, consensus is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, consensus, I mean, even today, as battered and bruised as the human rights movement is, uh, most nations really do not want to be listed as notorious violators. Mm -hmm. So, and as Mrs. Roosevelt said, human rights begin in the small places. And we're really, we're talking about things like conversion and transformation of culture, as well as um, philosophical foundations. Thank you very much. Thank you for your talk, Michael Crum, St. Vincent College. You maybe already answered my question when you were talking to Ryan Anderson, of a practical one. Um, is now a time to try to shore up things and maybe focusing on human nature. Uh, Pope Francis has talked about ideological colonization uh, being, being a problem, the, that primarily the concerns a lot of people at this conference have is coming from the West and is being imposed upon other countries. So it probably to us feels like the worldwide consensus on human nature, identity, and all of the concerns uh, is, is against us when it probably isn't, especially when we look at Africa and the growth of the church there. So I wonder, maybe actually now is the time <laughs> to try to turn to uh, back to this issue and focus it on human nature, uh, particularly as rooted in our biology, in our, in our personhood, which is what's being undermined coming out of elite institutions of, of the West. So is it possible that actually maybe now is prudentially a time to seek that consensus among really non-Western non nations. Yes, and uh, I guess you, uh, you tempt me to mention the conference that's coming up next week uh, on um, the idea of shared civilizational values. And uh, the, when I mentioned that certain projects are already underway, there's quite a wonderful project that is co-sponsored by, uh, Tim Shaw can correct me on this, if, uh, but it's co-sponsored by the world's largest Muslim political association, independent Muslim political association. It's called Nadlatu Ulama, and uh, it is distinguished by, among other things, commitment to religious freedom, commitment to religious pluralism, condemnation of the use of religion as a pretext for violence. And they are involved with another, with the world's largest group of political parties in association, Centrist Democrat International, which used to be Christian Democrat International. And they're in a project that they call Shared Civilization of Values, Tim, is that right? And uh, I think those studies are going to be enormously important in grounding uh, human rights in a and diverse traditions concepts of the human person and what is necessary for human flourishing. Thank you. And next week, there's going to be three days of discussion on it. <laughs> stay another week, Stick everybody. around. Yeah. <laughs>
Hi, uh, Chris Wolf, University of St. Thomas. And um, my question is, do you think that they ended up using the word dignity just because it was uh, just a thin, a thinner concept than if they'd use the word nature or, or common good or unalienable, unalienable rights? Did they just choose dignity because it was one of the thinnest things at their disposal? Well, what I think <laughs> is that uh, when people are at, I'm speaking of what lawyers do and extrapolating from that to what politicians on the Human Rights Commission did. Uh, when people are asked to draft a document in a hurry, they look around for something to well, I don't want to say the word, but I'll just say adapt. Mm -hmm. You know, plagiarism is very bad in, in the academic world, but uh, lawyers writing documents love to find another document that does just what they want. And uh, so, you know, uh, and I really think what happened was, uh, and this is on the basis of my reading of the records, uh, such as they are of the Human Rights Commission, they said, well, let's see, has anyone ever tried to do this before? Well, yes, in Latin America, they've been writing this Pan-American document. They've got a draft, they'll share it with us. And, we, and it is remarkable how much they borrowed from that dignitarian draft. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned, it's astonishing. You look through the records of the UNESCO Commission of Philosophers and the Human Rights Commission, no discussion of what dignity means. No discussion of why you have human rights. Which means, for the people who are engaged in the Shared Civilization Values Project, the field is wide open. <laughs> and I'll just add one brief thing. My one experience at UNESCO negotiating an international declaration, the title they settled on was, and this may sound familiar, the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights. So it's literally, the same name with the word bioethics stuck in the middle. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm Father Bob Goff from the Pontifical University Holy Cross in Rome. And right at the end of your presentation, Professor Glendon, you mentioned a warning of the risks of oppression that could result from the generation of new forms of rights. I was, I remember a 4th of July in Villa Richardson in Rome uh, with your, your one of your successors as uh, the U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, gave a speech on the 4th of July to the Vatican Diplomatic Corps in which he spoke of the progress in rights that the United States is struggling towards worldwide and challenging the Holy See to join this struggle. And towards this conclusion, he announced human rights are gender rights and gender rights are human rights. So could you expand more upon those concluding words in your presentation? Thank you. So not everything that is claimed to be a right is an internationally recognized human right. And this is a point I like to make over and over again because the list in the Universal Declaration is really modest. And um, sometimes people forget that. So you could have, I remember Mrs. Clinton famously, famously said one time, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. Well, that was half true. Um, <laughs> human rights are women's rights. Human rights belong to everybody by virtue of being human, but not everything that a particular nation state calls a right is an internationally recognized human right. So. Uh, one of the things that has done a lot of harm to uh, the whole idea of universal human rights is, as I mentioned, once it showed its power in the 1980s, everybody wanted to hop on the train. And now you have 2,000 claims of things that people often say are international rights, but are not. So, I mean, one of you know, it, if you just went back to the Universal Declaration and stuck to the basics, I do think that the Shared Civilizational Values Project would end up probably finding support for the basics. And maybe not always in the, and I won't say maybe, surely not always in the language of rights. The language of rights does, it does many good things. <laughs> 
and I appreciate the good things that rights do, but rights are not very good at solving complex social problems or profound moral controversies. Uh, thank you, and if I may, thanks to both of you, Professor Sneed and Glennon, for the amicus curiae that you mentioned that you pre prevented to the Supreme Court. Uh, we thank you. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Ambrose Donnelly and I graduated from the St. John's College. Yeah, this, me might too. Be, <laughs> this might be a quick historical question, but if I remember right, in the US when we proposed the Bill of Rights, there was some mm -hmm. opposition to the idea of enumerating uh, rights. Uh, if I rem remember right again, because it should be assumed that the rights are the people's unless given over to the government. I may have this wrong. Um, was there any opposition of that kind towards the UN Declaration of Human Rights, or was it that people knew, well, that didn't work because of World War II, or because it was a totally different project? There wasn't a constitution accompanying this. It was one of the first tasks that the UN assigned, one of the very first actions of the new UN was to instruct the Human Rights Commission to draft an international bill of rights. And that was just, you know, all, all, all forces forward on it. But of course, in, in our history, we had Alexander Hamilton said, the Constitution is itself a Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. meaning that our rights are protected by the structures of government, uh, the separation of powers, vertical and horizontal. And uh, of course, uh, that view didn't win out. But uh, I think it's good to remember that our rights are not only protected by the Bill of Rights, but by the structure of the great design for government that our founders gave us. Thank you. Hmm. Look who it is. It's Richard. Uh, Richard Dorflinger, fellow for the, Hello, the Richard. <laughs> Center for Ethics and Culture. Uh, it seems to me there's one area where the word dignity has again reared its head and been given great emphasis, and that's in UN statements on the human genome and human cloning. Uh, human Genome 1998 and cloning more recently in 2005. And that was hotly contested. Some of the nations did not want to declare against human cloning for research, only human cloning for reproduction. But one of the things that interested me is that uh, unlike the older declarations, uh, sort of triad of uh, fundamental freedoms, human rights, and human dignity, in some cases these were even just saying this practice is contrary to human dignity, and uh, seemed to rest everything on that. Uh, and I wondered if the reasons for that might be that, and it's hard to say you're violating somebody's human rights or their freedoms when they haven't existed yet until you take the act of making them. But it, I think it is easy for a lot of people to see that it's against that person's dignity to yeah. be created as a means to certain traits that you value more than the individual himself or herself. And I wonder if that's an area where uh, the, uh, the, the word of dignity might be revived again in international discussions because, I mean, there are, it's not as politicized as issues like abortion. You have Green Party people in some of the more liberal nations who are against the genetic manipulation idea there are concerns about the old eugenics and its uh, link with racism and other discrimination. And, uh, and it's, it's a new enough issue that it hasn't quite been locked into the political and national uh, boundaries that other things have. But I was interested that even as recently as 2005, dignity was being made to hold the whole, the whole basis for rejecting cloning. I wonder if you could uh, comment on that. Well, I, I think that uh, the question that Ryan asked about, you know, is the language of rights really useful for all the things that uh, societies want to protect? And um, I think, uh, you know, the question that doesn't fit into the rights category or the duties category, but a question that I think is appropriate to ask with all these questions, these new questions that are coming up, is uh, what kind of a person am I if I tolerate this sort of thing? And what, what, what kind of society are we making ourselves into if we 
take steps down that direction. Um, you know, it, uh, I mean, you think about, for example, um, I think the best argument that I've heard about animal rights, for example, has to do not with rights of animals, but what do we do to ourselves? What kind of person are we making ourselves into if we torture animals? You know, it's a, and I think this is involved with the problematic of dignity. In Catholic thought, uh, but the, it's a complex question, right? Uh, John Paul II said even a murderer has dignity, but uh, the teachings of the church also say that uh, Christian, live up to your dignity. You know, it's, dignity is something ontological, but it is also something that is moral. And uh, so Catholic teaching, I, and I don't know in every tradition, and, uh, but uh, the teaching that fed into the uh, dignitarian legal systems was uh, dignity is a very complicated idea. Father Henry. Yeah, Father Stefanos Hendrianto. I'm a Jesuit from Gregorian University. As you mentioned uh, before that uh, Pope uh, St. John Paul II and Benedict XVI used a lot of language human rights and devoted a lot of energy in that uh, area. But our current Pope, uh, Francis, I mean, unlike his predecessors, I mean, he, did not, he doesn't use a lot of language of human rights. One of the in best interpretations is that instead of preaching that his strategy is that let's reach out to the poor, to the margin, and hopefully human rights and dignity reappear in different way. So what do you think about this I mean, current Pope's I mean, approach compared to his predecessor? Well, uh, I, I don't really see a big difference uh, in um, the, the position of the, the John Paul II, Benedict, Francis, um, all the, in fact, all the popes since John the 23rd have, pra even Francis, highly praised the Human Rights Project. And at the same time, even back with John the 23rd, at the same time, they've um, called for foundations and for amplifying the concept. So I think that's just one of the things that uh, the sovereign of a universal church does is try to figure out how to enculturate these ideas. Yeah, quick follow up because I mean, uh, Lonergan in one of his treatises, he talked about communication, the importance. So the question is, I think that in what way now the church, especially the Pope, uh, with this approach, I think they can communicate this language better. That's uh, the, the, this something that maybe I get <laughs> your thought about that. I'm sorry, I didn't quite. Could you? No, no, I think that my point I didn't is that. I quite get what you said. Uh, I'm just I'm referring to Lonergan a little bit because I think that you, well, first of all, Lonergan in some way, I think that in one, his point is about communications. So my point is that in the end, that how about the church itself, I think, can communicate this, I mean, that language of human rights, I mean, in a better way compared to, I mean, that, uh, like, well. So uh, it, if I. Uh, if I've got your yeah. point, yeah. I think there is a strong and very respectable current in the church that does not like the language of rights. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, you know, we're a big church. <laughs> we got a billion people. And uh, these discussions, thank God the Catholic Church is a place where you can still talk about these things, right? <laughs> so um, these discussions are good and they're healthy. And... Uh, we learn a lot from each new voice. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, Perpetua Fisher from St. Vincent College. Um, I first off want to thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful. Um, and second of all, kind of touching on um, what you just said, you kind of gave in your presentation two sorts of definitions um, for human dignity, one being more grounded in um, the church and um, just knowing that our human rights are based in like what God gave us um, and the other kind of being based more in science um, and in like the rights of like I can do whatever science allows. How do you suppose that we can 
better merge these things so as to have like a universal sort of um, consent um, and knowledge of what human dignity is? Well, um, my friend from the Gregorian just mentioned Father Lonergan. Um, uh, one, one way of putting those ideas together is that um, the structures of human knowing are hardwired into, they're, they're universal. Uh, you know, all over the world, all the, the structures of experiencing and understanding and judging. And uh, many of us believe that that's God given. Thank you. Ambassador Glennon has been so generous with us this evening. Please join me in thanking her one more time. Okay, that was an extraordinary tour de force, but that's not surprising because that's what Marianne does. Marianne, thank you so much again for your thoughtful reflections. Before we break and, and conclude our event and, and turn the evening over to our reception, which you can already see set up behind you, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the many people who helped make these past few days together possible. So I'd like to extend on behalf of the Nicholas Center for Ethics and Culture and everyone who's enjoyed this event, our sincere thanks to Amy Seaman, Amber Kirk, and Lisa Vervinkt in University Enterprises and Events who managed the logistics of this event and welcomed us so warmly into this new beautiful conference space over in McKenna. I'd like to offer our thanks to the College of Arts and Letters, including its wonderful Dean, Sarah Mastillo, uh, as well as uh, Kristen Garvin Podell with the Institute for Scholarship in the Liberal Arts. <laughs> We'd like to thank everyone on the staff of the McKenna Conference Center and the Morris Inn, the AV technicians, the catering, the wait staff, the, the service staff, all of those who have worked so hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. We'd like to extend our special thanks to our own bishop, Kevin Rhodes, uh, the rector of the Basilica here, Father Brian Ching, and the staff of the Basilica of the Sacred Heart for the beautiful liturgies all weekend that we enjoyed. We'd like to thank our amazing De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture Soren Fellow volunteers, undergraduate and graduate students who prepared the rooms for every session. They directed visitors and they ferried guests in the golf carts through the rain and the snow of the frozen tundra of South Bend, Indiana. And of course, we'd like to extend our thanks to our more than 146 speakers, moderators, and friends, old and new of the De Nicola Center who participated in all the sessions. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank the amazing staff of the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture. And, and for those of you who've been with us in the past, you've heard me say similar things, but it's important to emphasize uh, every single year, the incandescent brilliance of our staff, the staff that is singly the best staff, not just at the University of Notre Dame, but of any, any place in the world where staffs are assembled and do work. Um, <laughs> these people are just un amazing, including Tracy Westlake, Laura Gonziorek, Petra Farrell, Ken Hellenius, Katie Brizak, and then finally, the extraordinary world-bestriding colossus of excellence Margaret Cabanis, who I told you before, is responsible for every single good thing that everyone experienced this weekend. Please, let's give a round of applause <laughs> to all of them. There she is. There's our Margaret. Stand up. <laughs> 
and friends, before we leave, I'd like you all to think about and accept our sincere invitation to come back soon to Notre Dame, to the DeNicola Center, to take part in future conferences, lectures, masses, tailgates, and events at our wonderful center. Uh, and let's continue fellowship over beverages and dessert, but mark your calendars. Next year, the 22nd annual fall conference, we will see you back here again, November 10th through 12th, 2022. So we'll see you next year, if not sooner. Thank you all. God bless. Travel safely. Good night. <laughs>